Welcome back to Introduction to Computational Fluid Dynamics. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking about derived quantities, which is part of our visualization module of our class. In the previous class, we looked at the most basic and useful plots for computational fluid dynamics, and we showed some example, examples for these. These included particular pros and cons of each type of plot. Remember, your plot should convey information to your viewer or reader and not distract them. It should be not an aesthetic competition, but a way to show quantitatively your results in the most efficient way possible. Today, we'll be talking about, of course, the field variables of once again and what the solver produces. Then we'll be talking about all the derived quantities we might find from these particular variables. And of course, these might be shown and plotted with the visualization software so that you might understand the flow and the physics of it better from your CFD data. It's also useful to derive some of these quantities so you might compare them with experimental data sets. What are the field variables? When we talk about the field variables, we're really speaking of the unknown variables, which are now known through the numerical solution process. These represent the variables that are dependent on everything else of the simulation, boundary conditions, discretization, constants, etc. So when the CFD solver ends successfully and you've done your checks like grid independence and convergence, we would typically like to know what these variables are and have them at each grid point as a function of space and perhaps time. That is, if it's an unsteady simulation, of course, we will have the time dependent uh, variables also. And it can be a very large data set. Remember, part of the visualization system or process is understanding large data sets, making meaning of a large amount of data. Typically, in compressible simulations, we will have the densities, the momentum, and some sort of energy term. It could also be pressure or temperature, depending on the assumptions of the equations, or it could be, say, entropy or another type of um, equation or variable. In compressible flows, you'll almost universally have the velocity field and pressure or temperature, but usually the velocity field and pressure. This is because in incompressible flows, of course, you're usually solving the continuity equation, momentum equation. Now, if we know these quantities without a particular turbulence model, then we still need to extract the flow physics properties and derive all other quantities. And we'll be showing the equations and these types of quantities and how they're used in CFD in particular. Note that we have not discussed turbulence models yet, and these represent additional field variables essentially, which of course we would have to visualize. And we'll look at some of those variables in this class and of course the future model on turbulence. First, the most important type of quantity from a DNS type simulation might be to derive average or statistical quantities, like ensemble averages too. So we can perform statistical operations of any type on the flow quantities that we desire. The first and most important and perhaps most popular is the time average. We'll write the time average as these little brackets on each side of the variable A, which represent the average of variable A. This is not a field variable here, it's just an arbitrary variable. And of course an average would be the integral from 0 to t, which is the time which we have collected the signal of A, and we'll integrate it and divide it by the total time. So this is nothing but adding up the total number of values of A through an integration and dividing by time, which is the definition of an average. It's a general form. We must also have an ensemble average. An ensemble average is nothing but adding up all the instances of A in one particular space and time, and then of course dividing through by the number of ensembles. So you might wonder, what kind of situations would I have where an ensemble average is more appropriate than, say, a time average? For example, if a flow is statistically stationary, like the exhaust from an engine that's been running for hours, and I start measuring, I could take a time average. Now, if my engine is starting up or shutting down, I would take an ensemble average of a flow variable at a particular time relative to the engine start. What does it mean if we combine the ensemble average strategy with the time average strategy? Now, the bottom line is, of course, that the ensemble average will be equivalent to the time average if they're applied to statistically stationary or steady flows. The ensemble average and time average will obviously be different if they're applied to a flow which is starting up or slowing down or doing something else. If it has transient behavior, the time average is not really the appropriate quantity to use always the ensemble average, if possible.
Let's now look at some derived quantities. The first, of course, most students have learned about in their first aerodynamics or fluid dynamics class. That's vorticity. And vorticity will be a quantitative measure at any point in space. It's a point or one point statistic and time of the rotation of the fluid. On the right, we have a very famous photo from NASA looking down the airfield and they've put a large plume of red smoke and let an aircraft take off through it which is shown in the lower left of the figure. Now here's the center of a vortex. You'll see that the vortex is spatial property and vorticity is a one point statistic. This is one of the most easy and simple derived quantities to calculate. If we were curious about circulation or our flow, it's a great quantity to understand it. The vorticity we'll call zeta on this slide and we'll use it interchangeably like many groups or omega and it's nothing but knoblock cross u. It's the cross product with the velocity essentially. Now you'll see from the plot here easily that vortice is not a vortex. A vortex is a spatial structure and is not a one-point statistic. Vorticity is a one-point statistic. Now Another interesting derived quantity might be these vortex tubes. And when we looked at visualizations previously and in the future, you'll see that some fully turbulent unsteady flows contain many tiny little tubes apparently. Well, these are essentially tubes of vorticity. Here we're plotting or showing vorticity uh, tubes. How do we do that? Well, we look for a vortex line, a vorticity line, which is a line which is everywhere tangent to the local vorticity vector. And it must obey this particular equation, which is a derived quantity because of course, we're finding omega and then we're finding lines or um, contours in space that obey this particular equation. And they'll of course make up these tubes or evolving surfaces within the turbulent flow. This is dx over omega sub x, dy over omega sub y, and x z over omega sub z. These are the vorticities in the x, y, and z direction respectively. Excuse me, this should be a dz. Now, a vortex tube will be a surface in the continuum formed by all vortex lines passing through a given closed surface in the continuum. Now, the strength of the vortex tube is the area integral of vorticity in any cross-section of the tube. This will be consistent down the length of the tube. For example, if we have these vortex lines which make up the tube or surface which wraps around itself, we might integrate across it at any one particular plane. This would be what we define as the vortex strength. It's the integration of vorticity across the plane. This should sound very familiar to you of a particular quantity which you've learned in your previous classes that has to do with circulation. Which brings us to, of course, circulation itself. Circulation is a line integral around a closed surface or curve of the velocity field. It will be related to vorticity by the following equation. Nabla cross V is, of course, the vorticity of the flow. Now the circulation will be some kind of integration of vorticity. Here's Stokes' theorem, the same Stokes, of course, of the Navier-Stokes equations. He says a surface integral of omega for omega will be equal to the contour or circular integral around the circumference of the vortex tube, in this case, of the velocity with each length element L. We'll call that capital gamma for circulation. With this definition, we can integrate over any particular uh, part of our CFD, and we can do that with a surface integral within the flow, or we can do that a line integral over some vortex tube. It's our choice. In practice, it's much easier to calculate the right-hand side of equation. This whole process is shown graphically in the lower right. Here's some arbitrary surface in green. That would be represented by, of course, ds. And every part of the surface, there's some vorticity with unit normals. We, of course, take omega and multiply by each um, differential element a and add them all up to approximate the integral. We could also just simply integrate around the surface. It's much harder to integrate around the surface for particular vortex and uh, flows. I prefer to find the surface integral. You'll see it's easier in practice. Now, you might infer that the vorticity is the circulation per unit area about an infinite loop. That's what essentially this Stokes theorem is showing, which you've learned in calculus three, but maybe just didn't apply it to the fluid dynamics problem. You might also write that the flux of the vorticity is the circulation. 
So it's two physical ways to look at this quantity now, and you'll easily find it through CFD in your visualization software. The next quantity of interest is, of course, helicity. Helicity is an invariant of the Euler equations, and it might be viewed as a measure of the linkages or knottiness of vortex lines in the flow. We might view it as a measure of the shellarity of the flow also, or it could be a measure of the knottiness of a vortex tube. Now, if we're looking for the knottiness or helicity of a particular vortex tube, we might look for, once again, these circles or constant lines of vortexes and then find the helicity from this. The helicity is defined in 1969 by Moffet. Here it is, this capital H will be the integral of the volume of the velocity with the inner product of nabla cross V, that's of course the cross product, of dV. So you see this is actually a volumetric integral over some part of the space of the flow. We can do this piecewise and look at these terms throughout the flow and plot them as a contour plot. For example, we would not necessarily evaluate helicity over the whole volume. We might actually do it on a per volume basis, that is for each volume element, finite element, or finite difference grid point to find the helicity. You can view helicity as particular high values of its density will be associated with locally high values of swirl the velocity is large and the vorticity vector is aligned with the velocity. Visualization strategies have come into play and use helicity to locate vorticities in, to differentiate between primary and secondary vorticities and to mark their separation and attachment lines. This is shown over on the right hand side of the figure where we have the so-called flow within a heart. This is a little bit simplified, but we, in the left we have streamlines, which are rather hard to see what's happening, but you get a general idea. On the right, there's the same plot of the same streamlines, but helicity is shown. You'll see that there's very bright parts of helicity in the pink regions and low in the blue. What does this mean? Of course, very high regions show where these particular vortex tubes are separating from each other. You can see this happens on the right side and in the top where the flow is splitting in two different directions. It's a great marker for that to understand general flows. Where these tubes are not separating from each other, you might view helicity as these tubes are being generally packed in parallel to each other, much like packed strands of spaghetti. They're not separating from each other. It's an excellent quantity and integrated in most visualization softwares, and it's very fun to calculate, especially if you have a recirculating flow. It's a very useful visualization tool in turbulence. One of the most interesting and most used quantities, which most students have never examined, is called entropy. Entropy is the integral of the vorticity. It is an important concept in fluid dynamics for the Navier-Stokes equations, especially for turbulence. Under certain conditions, the rate of decrease of the energy of a fluid flow will be proportional to the entropy. So, in this case, when we're studying turbulence under certain criteria being met, the rate of decrease of energy will be proportional to the entropy. Let's define it. Entropy is the most simple definition on the right. It would be the magnitude of nabla cross V, which of course is vorticity squared, over any particular set of dimensions. For example, in two dimensions, we would write it as the magnitude of omega squared integrated over the surface. In three dimensions, we would do a three-dimensional integral to find the total entropy. Now in practice, it'd be nothing but omega squared, the magnitude of omega, and square it at every particular grid point in the flow. This is shown in the particular entropy of the turbulent boundary layer shown on the lower part of the page. Here the flow moves from left to right, and the y-axis is y over d. That's essentially the distance from the wall, non-dimensionalized. Entropy is colored by these bright orange and white reddish lines. White was the highest and black is the lowest in terms of the color scale. So you see here, out here with my cursors, there's absolutely no entropy because of course the vorticity is zero. Here the magnitude of vorticity is very large, its largest values. This can really show energy dissipation rates in some sense according to the vorticity and entropy theory. This is another useful derived quantity which helps you visualize flows. One very popular metric is viscous dissipation, and this is nothing but evaluating the right-hand side of the viscous terms of the Navier-Stokes equations. This can be written compactly on the left for one particular form. 
Viscous dissipation is useful because it indicates regions of the, in a flow where irreversible losses occur. This viscous dissipation will involve, of course, viscous term, velocity, the coefficient of viscosity, and be written as perhaps phi here. One example of this viscous dissipation is shown on the right, where we have, of course, plots of streamlines, and we've colored in areas where we have high viscous dissipation. It can be, of course, calculated only if you know the velocity and viscosity terms. That's really all you need to do a proper calculation. And, of course, it could be a volumetric integration. If you integrate the viscous dissipation of the whole domain, then of course you would calculate the total viscous dissipation. You could also plot it on a per element or grid point basis to find out regions where the highest viscous dissipation is occurring. This can also be very useful. Remember, the viscous dissipation is essentially an energy transfer term. The energy is being transferred from the kinetic energy of the flow into heat and acoustic waves, mostly heat though. One of the most popular and interesting types of derived quantities is the so-called Lamb vector. And there was a search for a very useful vector, which Coleman and Oman in 2004 uh, proposed. They said that the Lamb vector will be the cross product of the velocity and vorticity. So initially, we already have the velocity from the flow. We then find the derived quantity of vorticity and we take their cross product. This is essentially the Lamb vector. It is a vector found from the cross product of velocity and vorticity, an interesting quantity. You can see that anywhere in the flow, if velocity is zero, or vorticity is zero, of course the Lamb vector will be zero. Think about the physical meaning of this, and we'll illustrate this in a second. If we look at the momentum equation in this particular form, the left-hand side is pretty typical, and so is the right-hand side, we might rewrite it using the new definition of the Lamb vector as the third equation. If we do that, we will find this particular equation, partial v partial t minus the Lamb vector equals negative lambda of h, which is essentially an energy term, minus the velocity v of lambda cross zeta. Here, once again, of course, zeta is the vorticity. Here, h is the pressure divided by density plus the kinetic energy plus, of course, some um, potential term. Now, if the flow is incompressible and inviscid, if we make these two assumptions on our equation, we'll then have i will be nothing but lambda, that is the gradient of our energy term h. So what have we done? We have defined through this process a new potential function for a particular type of flow if it's incompressible and inviscid, and it has vorticity in it. That's a very interesting process. Of course, all this was performed originally and viewed by Horace Lamb, which we'll talk about in a second. We can also find h in a little bit different way. We might show that the Laplacian of h will be nabla dot of the lambda vector, the inner product, will also be equal to lambda with the inner product of the velocity cross the vorticity, which of course is lambda. That's a different way of expanding it out. We can now take this new definition and rearrangement in the equations, if it's compressible or incompressible, it doesn't matter, but it's the definition, and form new kinds of isosurfaces of H, if we so desire, which is a type of energy. And they will contain both the velocity and vorticity. Is, now, if the flow is viscous, then the Lamb vector is rotational, and by the Helmholtz decomposition, it can be written this way. We can further decompose the Lamb vector through the Helmholtz decomposition approach. What does this mean? We decompose the Lamb vector into both two parts, an irrotational part and a rotational part of the vectors. There's a process to do this, and the mathematical form is shown here. The Lamb vector would be, of course, something like nabla h plus the cross product of nabla cross psi. Here, psi is a vector potential for the lambda real part of the lambda vector. This will be used for free detection of vortex cores and regions of shear and axisymmetric swirling jet flows, as two examples. Let's look at two examples of the lamb vector. This is the so-called Moffet vortex that has no swirl. Interesting that a vortex has no swirl. Here you can see contours of streamlines going through this particular Moffet vortex, and the contour represents one isosurface of the Lamb vector magnitude. On the right, we've shown the same types of Lamb vectors now plotted within the flow on one particular 
um, curvilinear plane. And we've also plotted the stream functions as red lines. You can see that these are excellent ways to isolate the exact structure of vorticities within a flow, which is critical for turbulence. Some of you might be wondering who Horace Lamb was. Well, he was a British scientist who lived from 1849 to 1934. He was an applied mathematician, and he authored many influential books in classical physics, including hydrodynamics and the dynamical theory of sound. While he was a student at Trinity College, he studied under none other than James Maxwell, who created, of course, the electromagnetic equations, and George Stokes, who, of course, is name is attached to the Navier-Stokes equations. That's a very unique education. He was, of course, known for descriptions of special waves and thin solids, which are now called today Lamb waves. The vorticity was coined by Lamb in 1916. So when you hear the word vorticity, it's actually his use of the word. And he used the word and defined it for the first time in 1916. Of course, he was a fellow of the Royal Society later. Here's his picture on the right in a really nice suit. Good formal picture. Anyway, we use his name today also for the Lamb vector. What's interesting about him too is that he was really an acoustician who studied waves, but this led to his study of turbulence. There's a lot of stories about acousticians making many of the largest applications on turbulence theory. Another quantity is the shear stress tensor. This is often on course defined on the right hand side of equations. It will be directly used with the energy momentum equations anyway within the solver and many turbulence models. It is not normally part of the solution or solution file which are written with CFD, but it's easily calculated and stored, and we might find it during post-processing. For example, the shear stress tensor, tau ij, will be 2 mu of Sij soup star, and here's Sij. We've defined these and talked about these variables and their definitions in the beginning part of the class in fluid dynamics. Now, we have not introduced the Reynolds stress. A Reynolds stress is nothing but a time average of a quantity plus its perturbation. That is, it's a constant, if it's statistically stationary flow, which is the time average of, say, u, plus the fluctuating part of u. If we add the average of u plus its fluctuation, we will, of course, get the total value of u. This is Reynolds stress, and we'll talk a lot more about this later in the class. We can then take the Reynolds stress and formulate, excuse me, we can take the Reynolds averaging and then formulate the Reynolds stress, just like we have the viscous stress tensor from the Navier-Stokes equations. There's another set of equations which we'll derive in this class called the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations that has an equivalent stress tensor called tau ij prime in this instance. And it's defined as rho of bar ui prime uj prime. The primes are the fluctuating components about the base flow or time average flow. The bar represents a time average. So this is nothing but the Reynolds stress is the density times the time average of u prime u prime at ij ij are index notations these can easily be find used to find drag or other turbulence quantities it is very often that we can also measure reynolds stress experimentally in the laboratory this is part of the reason why it's so important to keep track of this problem in a cfd code let's look at one example of the reynolds stress here's flow through a turbine cascade where we have plotted and shown one of the turbine blades. We have periodic boundary conditions on the top and bottom, and flow moves from left to right. We've also plotted streamlines. Streamlines are coming in, and of course, they're going around the flow. There's some fence in the flow, too, which alters it. Now, in this particular flow, we've shown contours of the magnitude of the shear stress within the flow. This is where the most turbulent shear stress is occurring, and you'll see it's not within the boundary layer at all. It can happen in the large areas right in the middle of the flow. This leads to large dissipation patients, of course, turbulent kinetic energy and all kinds of other issues. It's a critical quantity in the theory of turbulence in the prediction of computational fluid dynamics codes. This will be stressed in our next module on turbulence. Next, we have turbulent kinetic energy. Now, in fluid dynamics, the turbulent kinetic energy is a critical term because it is the mean turbulent kinetic energy per unit mass associated with the eddies of the turbulent flow. So just like we have a kinetic energy, we also have an equivalent turbulent kinetic energy. There are actually two different measures of the energy within the flow, especially if there's turbulence. It's much more common for in CFD to examine turbulent kinetic energy than it is to look at the total kinetic energy of the flow. 
Now physically, the turbulent kinetic energy is characterized by measures of root mean square velocity fluctuations. We've just talked about Reynolds stresses, where the prime values represent the fluctuating quantity about a base flow. Now the mean kinetic energy per unit mass will be one half of the averages of the velocities at every particular grid point. So we calculate this on a one point statistic or grid point basis. The turbulent kinetic energy per unit mass, which we might write as bar E, will go as one half of the R mass value, root mean square value of each of the velocity fluctuations. Root mean square. We take the prime, that's the fluctuating value of the velocity in the x direction, we square it, and then we take the time average. We sum up the three components, and of course we get the total turbulent kinetic energy at any one particular time and space at a single point on the grid. Now, we also have the mean kinetic energy and turbulent kinetic energy as we've shown. These are both very useful for showing results, but TKE, turbulent kinetic energy, has very special and important meaning in turbulent flows, and it's most associated with the fluctuating part of the flow field about an average. So that is, the turbulent kinetic energy is the measure of the kinetic energy of the turbulence at any point in the flow. That is a critical quantity. It shows how energetic it is. Many types of plots are shown and derived relative to turbulent kinetic energy. And we'll find equations to find turbulent kinetic energy and track it directly as a field variable in the turbulence modeling section of the class. Let's now look at some examples of turbulent kinetic energy. The first is from NOAA, which is in the top part of the figure. NOAA is our nation's leading scientific organization to study the atmosphere and the ocean. They are an amazing group of scientists. And of course, you probably know them through their Hurricane Prediction Center, the NOAA Hurricane Center. Now, these are particular plots showing maximum values of turbulence, that is turbulent kinetic energy, or intensity in this case, between six kilometers and 12 kilometers above the United States. They've shown these in these particular plots. These quantities, as you might imagine, are very critical for pilots, for instance. This helps them track where to fly commercial aircraft and avoid regions of high turbulence. We've all been on commercial flights, or at least most of us, where we experience some kind of extreme or small amounts of turbulence, so the whole aircraft, of course, is vibrating. It's vibrating due to the turbulence within the air. By looking at turbulent kinetic energy through predictions or satellite data, or it's a derived quantity in that case, we can, we can fly our aircraft in regions with low turbulence for more comfortable flights. In the lower part of the figure, we have a calculation of a turbulent jet. The flow moves from left to right. This white part is the nozzle. The lower axis is the axisymmetric boundary condition. There's a far field boundary condition, a static pressure outlet, and a stagnation pressure inlet within the nozzle. Now, this is a plot, contour plot, of turbulent kinetic energy. Here's the levels and scales. K here represents TKE, and they're normalizing turbulent kinetic energy by the jet velocity squared. Why? Because the units of turbulent kinetic energy are an energy quantity. It is u squared over t squared. That is a velocity squared divided by a time squared term. In this case, meter squared per second squared. And of course, we can normalize by the jet velocity in this case meter squared per second squared. This is the most typical way to normalize a plot of turbulent kinetic energy. The highest magnitude of TKE is shown in red, which is this large lobe connected to the nozzle exit. And you can see there's almost no turbulence or kinetic energy of the turbulence within the nozzle. And then there's this high-speed shear layer. The high-speed shear layer is a production mechanism of turbulence. The turbulence intensity will become higher and higher and higher within the shear layer. As it goes farther down the stream, the shear layer mean velocities relative to each other are smaller and smaller, and the turbulence becomes fully developed from this production rate system in here and it starts to decay downstream. This can all be shown in the contour plot and it's one of the most studied and popular flows in CFD. An extremely important derived quantity, of course, is dissipation. It is a simple and naive definition, perhaps, for some, but is the rate of conversion of energy into heat, is the dissipation of the turbulent kinetic energy in turbulent flows. So in a turbulent flow, like turbulent kinetic energy is the energy at a particular space and time, the dissipation rate is the rate of change of TKE into other types of energies. Now this is only useful typically 
in theory in theoretical fluid dynamics and computational fluid dynamics. In experimental work, of course, it's important also, but there's no excellent methodology to measure dissipation experimentally in a flow. Therefore, we need to try and measure the dissipation. We need to make sure that the dissipation is reasonable in our particular CFD solutions, if you can calculate it in a particular way. So try and directly calculate dissipation if possible. Of course, it's a derived quantity. So sometimes it's a field variable if we have a particular turbulence model, but this is not always the case. Some turbulence models will give us dissipation directly what if our solution of the fear within the field variables. Other times we would have to derive it from other quantities. Now, if it's a turbulent flow and we have turbulent models, we might have a dissipation which looks like the one in the middle of the page is the dissipation rate at which TKE, turbulent kinetic energy, is converted into thermal internal energy. Here, it's equal to the viscous term times time average, which is the bar, of partial UI prime, partial XK, partial UI prime, partial XK. Here we have two dummy indices, and of course we're summing over them. Now, this is a very large term, because of course we would hold I equals one, then sum over K, then add I equals two, then sum over K, then add i equals three, then sum over k from one to three, and add up all these terms. You can see it's rather large, expanded. Now, for compressible flows, the definition is actually a little bit different. If we make the incompressible assumption, of course, we recover the term I just showed. Incompressible form would have this form here. We would have one over the time average value of rho times the time average of the time average of the shear stress tensor times partial u i partial x j. We've defined these other terms down here to remind you, but these are derived, of course, in part of the Navier-Stokes equations in conservative form. We'll show plots of dissipation later, and through our class, we'll also be able to show dissipation rates. Let's now look at periodic events. Imagine our flow has some periodicity or periodic events, perhaps it's the shedding be behind a circular cylinder, and we're interested in finding the periodic events of the shedding, that is the von Karman street. In this case, we can use the Fourier transform to find a further derived quantities. We can take our time domain solutions, perhaps, and convert them into the frequency domain by integrating over time. This can be used to also solve equations in the frequency domain. For example, for some of our equations, we could take them and convert them into the frequency domain and solve on a per frequency basis. We won't talk too much about this in this class, but it's a very popular approach today. Now, we need to find and analyze particular modes or particular periodic events within the flow. We would introduce, of course, the forward and backward Fourier transform. These should be familiar to the students in this class. For example, the forward Fourier transform will be f hat of psi will be the integral over all space of f, which is, of course, in the spatial domain here, with the Fourier transform uh, part of the integrand, which is e to the negative 2 pi i x psi dx. Here, by integrating over x, we're transforming our variable x to psi. In the case of temporal work, we would change psi to, of course, omega, or frequency, f, and the right-hand side, psi, to, of course, omega, or frequency. x would be changed to time, t. The same thing can be done in the backward transform. Remember, if we take a forward transform of data and then take the subsequent backward transform, if we're doing it correctly, we should arrive at the same data. That is, the forward transform and inverse should give us the same result. Here's one example of looking at uh, Fourier transforms which is a particular set of data. On the x-axis, we have the engine order, or the revolutions. In the y-axis, we have the amplitude of the Fourier harmonics, that is, the coefficients of the um, uh, the Fourier transform of the particular variables. Here we've shown particular data between experiments and CFD as lines and dots respectively. You can see that if we take the data from the experiment and perform a Fourier transform in space in this case and plot the particular modes as revolutions and compare the same data with particular unsteady CFD, we're capturing the same trend. There's a little bit too much energy for particular cases between experiment and CFD up here, but we're matching right on at higher levels. And so it's very interesting for these types of systems, we can actually perform Fourier transforms and compare the modal amplitudes. And this is another important way to predict things. These modal amplitudes would be critical when looking at vibrational problems. 
Another major difficulty in CFD is examining and finding out where shocks are. For example, in the upper right figure, we have a Schlieren image of an X-15 type vehicle moving from right to left and it's being held steady in the wind tunnel. The flow is moving from left to right. And we see, of course, shock waves coming off the vehicle with a turbulent wake. This little lines here are just wires holding things in place. Don't worry about them. Anyway, we might want to try and do CFD about this vehicle, and we have to resolve and find out where shocks are. So if we have a CFD solution, we need to ascertain if it's a shock wave, of course, or a slip line or some other phenomenon that has a very high density gradient, as shown in the Schlieren. So traditionally, there's different methods to visualize these shocks, and these visualizations have very similar images of the particular slip lines. For example, let's look at some of these so-called uh, CFT solutions. We have the Mach number, pressure, density, and temperature contours. They all look rather similar, but if you've taken compressible flow, you'll understand what all these phenomena are. These are basically contour lines where they're all co-located is where, of course, the location of the shock is. We need to find this automatically with our visualization software, and this might always not always be simple. This is done through the so-called shock sensor or shock capturing algorithm. This is usually applied in the solver, but here we're going to apply it in the visualization algorithms of our visualization system. Shock capturing can be ambiguous. Here we've shown four cases, the pressure, Mach number, density, and temperature contours. Now, you can imagine, and by looking at these, you could guess, maybe naively, that these are all shocks. But by plotting different quantities, there's actually two types of flow phenomena happening in these particular cases. This is critical in aerospace engineering, and often new engineers will be confused by these type of plots. They're not going to be able to distinguish between, say, shear layers and shock waves. In the upper left, we show that we have three particular shock waves. In the upper right, we show Mach number, and we see the same three shock waves, but the reflected shock is weaker, and there's a shear layer apparent interesting. So you can see, of course, and we know from our compressible flow classes in theory, that the pressure across the shear layer is going to be relatively constant. That's why it doesn't show up in the pressure contour plot. On the lower left, we've shown density and temperature contours. So by comparing the pressure contour plot, in this case, with other quantities, we can identify perhaps what's a shock wave or shear layer. This becomes even more complicated and almost impossible to do manually and visually if we do not if we are in three dimensions and if our flow is temporally evolving, that is time dependent and three dimensional, it's gonna be very hard to identify what are shock waves and shear layers because these types of plots can't be done hundreds of thousands of times to analyze a simulation to detect shocks for shear layers. Thankfully, there's been some work on how to do this. One is to find the so-called maximum of the density gradient. And of course, density gradients are critical for shock waves and shear layers. The first and second derivatives of the density can be found in the direction of the density gradient. So we find the density gradient direction and find equivalent d rho and dn, and d rho dn squared. That is the second derivative. Now, the isosurface of the second derivative of density if we set it to zero to find the isosurfaces, will correspond to the so-called maxima or minima of the streamwise density gradient. That makes sense from calculus. It's a scalar quantity, which is a one-point statistic. Now, the first derivatives will be used to filter the variables. Once we filter the variables through an if statement, perhaps, looping through our spatial domain, we can then divide our flow phenomena into two different types. The first, of course, will be corresponding to shocks, where partial rho partial n is greater than zero will be a shock wave. If partial rho partial n was less than zero, it would be an expansion wave. We can then easily label these through this iterative process, this logical process in our visualization diagram. Then we can create a new filter. We would say, perhaps, that partial rho partial n is greater than epsilon with some small value of epsilon, like 0 0.1 or 0 0.01. And we'll set this to filter out the weak shock waves from the strong density gradients. This way we can try and change and get away from the idea of just having density gradients in the flow from other phenomena from particular shocks. This is probably one of the simplest shock censoring or shock capturing algorithms one can put in a CFD code or a visualization system. Let's look at another method, which is based on the normal Mach number instead of, say, density. Remember that the normal shock wave theory is valid for oblique shock waves in the normal direction. 
If you don't understand this, please review the theory. But basically, we can use the theory to understand and cross normal shock waves by rotating the coordinate frame and looking at the normal components across an oblique shock wave. Now, the normal Mach number to the particular shock wave will be obtained from the pressure gradient. Once this is done, an isosurface of the unity normal of Mach number might be represented by a shock wave surface. We can then formulate a mathematical function for the stationary shock wave detection. Let's do this now. We've done this in the first equation on slide 24. Based on the normal Mach number, we might write Ma sub n will go as the Mach number times, excuse me, the inner product of the gradient of pressure divided by the magnitude of the gradient pressure. Simplifying and expanding out Mach number as V over A, where A is the speed of sound and V is the velocity, we can write it in this form. This, of course, will be equal and set to unity. Now, for shocks that are moving, we might find a formulation that tracks the speed of the shock like this, which is much more complicated. We won't go through this equation, but just know that the general form here for a stationary shock wave will take the form as the first equation. It goes as, of course, isosurfaces which are equal to one of the Mach number with the inner product of the gradient of pressure divided by the magnitude of the gradient of pressure. These shock capturing algorithms can be very complicated. I've shown one from a text here. I'll let you take a few minutes and read it. You'll get an idea of the types of algorithms which are implemented in visualization software to extract the locations of shock waves perhaps. Now we've talked about two particular shock detection algorithms. The first method is of course the density gradient maxima, and the second is the normal Mach number. These were proposed by two different sets of authors. There's another set called the method of characteristics, which uses the method of characteristics, which is illustrated here. The formulations are shown in this third column, and of course we've shown some particular property of these. It's not too important, but just recall that in many visualization software, these particular algorithms are implemented in the software itself, and you get to choose. And you can now see what type of equations and algorithms are used to extract the shocks. Of course, they'll have some different results, and there's certain pros and cons to each approach. Let's change topics to another derived quantity, which is very, very popular in CFD today. This is so-called Q criterion. The Q criterion is an excellent method to visualize coherent vortices within the floral field. This is very much like just applying vorticity or vortexes or maybe lamb vectors, but this is one of the most popular approaches and creates many of the beautiful pictures you've seen in this class. It represents isopressure surfaces, that is surfaces of constant pressure surrounding, surrounding vertical structures. The Q criterion is named after the second invariant of the velocity plossing of U. Here's the real definition of the Q criterion. Now, we'll say Q is one half of omega omega ij minus ss ij. Here omega goes as uij minus uji over 2 and sij of uij plus uji over 2. You'll see sij is the exact same form we defined earlier. But think about it this way. Look at these two terms and what they mean. It is really the balance between the rotation rate and the strain rate of the fluid. That's critical. The Q criterion is the balance between the rotation rate and strain rate of the fluid. So if we set and plot Q equals zero, then we're showing surfaces where the rotation rate and strain rate are perfectly balanced. We can set positive values of Q. For example, we set this equation, Q equals one, and solve for those isosurfaces with the left-hand side in this case. Then we'll find and isolate areas where the strength of the rotation overcomes the strain. Alternatively, if we set Q equals to a negative value, then the strain rates are dominating the rotation rates. So we can actually plot multiple isosurfaces of Q and color them how we wish to understand the balance between, of course, rotation rates and strain rates. These will form surfaces by making them eligible as vortex envelopes. We can now show also that Q is one half the Laplacian of the static pressure. This is done in this bottom equation. Here we replace omega ij omega ij with its definition of omega squared. Of course, this will be equal to 
Sij plus one half of epsilon ijk omega k, Sij plus one half omega ijk omega k. We've defined this permutation notation in the mathematical review of the class. If you don't remember this, now's a good time to go back and see how we made this simple step through changing into a permutation framework. Notice all these subscripts are indexed for Einstein notation. We can then expand the right-hand side out through a series of steps and show that Q is really one half row of nabla squared P. That is the Laplacian of P divided by one half the density. Fascinating. Most people will calculate Q criterion through the actual definition and then finding isosurfaces by equating it to a constant. Let's now look at some examples of Q criterion. One might say, what is the threshold of Q? Well, let's example through an LES, large eddy simulation of a channel flow. This is an unsteady flow that's time dependent of turbulence in the channel. Here we have six plots, A, B, C, D, E, F. It's all exactly the same flow, but simply with different values of the Q criterion. The label says it's the threshold effects on near wall vorticities induced by the Q criterion. In A, we have Q equals 0.2, B, we have Q equals 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1, and 1.2. You can see that if we increase Q, what is happening? We're having different visualizations of these types of vortices. Here, since it's all positive, we're actually looking at the increased rotation rate relative to the strain rate, as you see right here in Q. This way, we can easily visualize these types of flows and these types of relationships. It's an excellent visualization tool for an unsteady flow. We'll try and make one Q criterion plot in our class using an unsteady data set. Let's look at some more fun examples of Q criterion. On the left, we have a backward facing step. The flow moves from lower left to upper right. You can see these contours, which of course are the constant Q criterion for 0 0.25. The computational grid is superimposed behind it, which represents the wall in this case. It's the surface. These Q criterion or vorticities are above it. Now the flow comes in and certain instabilities start to form. There's some vortex roll up, which you're seeing here. These vortices start breaking down at the famous horseshoe-like structures. These further decompose and decay in these elongated vortices. This is one simple explanation and visualization qualitative, mind you, it's a qualitative plot of the physics of a backward facing step. This is absolutely fascinating because of course it gives you a general idea of the instabilities and decay to turbulence of the flow. This is done through the Q criterion in this case. It's a wonderful way to describe it. And you've now learned something very simple about the physics of backward facing step and of how the flow breaks down into turbulence. This can also be shown and explained in the same way for flow over cavity. Here the blue is the structured grid on the wall. The green is the structured grid which represents a hole in the wall or a large box. It's essentially the cavity. These are both surface grids and of course volumetric grids exist all and everywhere else in the domain. Here through the Q criterion at 0 0.25 we've shown how the flow moves from lower left. It separates off the lip of the cavity and goes over the top of it. And these large vortices pair along each edge and they roll up and break down and they move downstream. They've labeled all these types of vortices which all have particular names in the vortex theory of turbulence. There's primary vortices which are the first ones and then there's secondary and third and other kinds of vortices which they labeled as the so-called necklace vortice and secondary vortice. That now completes our module on visualization. We looked at a number of visualization techniques, talked about software, kinds of graphs, and derived quantities. Almost everything we've done today is automatically done through excellent visualization software. And we'll generally use that software. If you write your own CFD code, sometimes, and many current codes do, find derived quantities at the end of the simulation or even during runtime. For example, Coefficient of lift is a derived quantity from the field variables. You might track coefficient of lift with residual to see the convergence of a steady flow and solution. This is very typical where they've taken a derived quantity from the visualization stage and put it in the solver. Nonetheless, next time we'll be moving to turbulence modeling in our turbulence modeling module. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.